There you go. Action. Good to go. Action. <laughs> All right. So we um, are going to talk about my testimony tonight. First off, I want to make sure everybody knows the schedule. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, we will be opening the church for the first time in a couple of weeks for an unaddicted service. Uh, Aaron Lawson and the folks from New Life will be leading worship. And Clint Davidson um, will be bringing the word, and he and his daughters will also be singing. They were there for our benefit singing. Clint used to come to Far City, Arkansas, where I was in federal prison and preach. He's dynamic and excited to hear him <clears throat> bring the word tomorrow night. Sunday morning, we'll be back, normal service at 1030. So y'all be sure to join us if you can. Um, <clears throat> You know, my testimony is, uh, people hear bits and pieces of it and all of my sermons, but I don't know if uh, there ever been, besides some family members, have heard everything uh, because it's pretty in-depth. Um, but I want to talk about, just real quick, um, start off by talking about addiction. Um, 2017, 72,000 people died from addiction. That's drug overdoses. That's 6,000 a month, 1,500 a week, 214 a day, nine per minute, one per six seconds. And that's three people died while I was talking about those statistics. And uh, in 2020, it's looking like it's gonna be a much, much worse year on kind of um, uh, the quarantine and the isolation of people that have struggled with addiction and the relapses. And then there's a lot of suicides that are, are addiction related, but don't get counted in that um, because of the, the, the desperate nature of addiction. You know, and ultimately darkness's goal is to kill you. He said that thief cometh not but to kill, still and destroy. Ultimately, goal, the dark goal of darkness is to destroy you. Um, when I hear this debate, man, it just, it irritates me. I hate when I hear people try to debate whether addiction is a disease or it's a choice. People who say it's a disease want to not do anything about it. People that say it's a choice don't want to help people that are caught up in it. Now, I, the way that I look at it is um, I have to relate it to type 2 diabetes, which I struggled with. In my 20s, I had let my weight get out of control. I don't know if many of you have seen the pictures where I was pushing 300 pounds. And I had the disease of type 2 diabetes. However, the choices that I made resulted in the disease. The idea whether it's a choice or a disease, the body of Christ needs to completely remove that narrative from the, the conversation. We don't even need to ask that question. We don't even need to talk about it. Yes, it's a choice. Yes, it's a disease. And yes, we have the answer. Um, you know, one of the things that I always do, and a lot of times I get asked to come out and talk to somebody that's uh, struggling and, and, you know, maybe shooting heroin or, or, or shooting ice. And I'm talking about some pretty desperate situations. People on the verge of, um, you know, they're one shot away from death. You know, I, I've mentioned, you know, we've had, I've preached a couple of them funerals this year, uh, three of them, and uh, man, that's three too many. Been to a couple other ones. It's just not a, um, it's not something that I like to do. Uh, but so, one of the things that I always ask people when I'm talking to them about this and trying to, unpack why they're doing what they're doing is I ask them why. Why are you doing this? And you know what? I get the same answer from everybody. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm doing it. Man, I've asked this question I don't know how many times and I get the same answer. I want you to think about that. They don't know why. Well, in order for me to understand why I was doing what I was doing, I had to do a lot of unpacking and uncovering to get to the root of the problem. And another thing that I always use that, that I think really drives the point home is I've never met a five-year-old little girl 
that said, hey, when I'm 25, I want to be working a truck stop selling my body to support my drug habit. Has anybody ever met a five-year-old little boy that said, hey, by the time I'm 23 years old, I want to be doing 20 years in, in state prison uh, to be just like my daddy for selling dope or by the time I'm 30 years old, I want to be strung out on alcohol. Kids never think like that. Why? Because that's not a life goal. But something between the time they were five and the time they were 30 and the time they were five and the time they were 25, something happens. The why is what we have to unpack. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to unpack my why. But before I get there, we need to talk about generational iniquities or, or, um, or uh, DNA issues or learned traits. We often see that children and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren will suffer the, the sins of their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. And we can even back that up in uh, Exodus, the 20th chapter. It says that the sin, the particular sin will be passed to the third and the fourth generation. So this iniquity, this propensity toward a particular sin. Well, I want to talk about my dad real quick. A lot of people know my dad as Bishop John Odell Green Sr. White hair, 850 credit score. His yeses were yeses. His noes were noes. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of exceptional character. He was a man that loved his family. That's how y'all know him. Let me tell you about the other Odell Green, the bootlegger, the vice president of the Iron and Steel Workers Union, the man strung out on speed that had an addiction to methamphetamine. Let me tell you about a man that got saved and then one of his union buddies who resigned from the union and one of his union buddies walked up on the loading dock and slapped him in his face as hard as he could. Daddy looked at him and said, hey, why'd you do that? He said, I wanted to see if you were really saved. Let me tell you about a man that told me about how he stabbed a man in the back one time. The, the, the blade of the tip of the butcher knife broke. The knife slid down his pants, cut his belt, and then they beat the mess out of it. And let me tell you about the time that my mom unloaded a shotgun. 30 minutes later, somebody knocks on my dad's door wanting to fight. My dad takes the shotgun. He puts it in the guy's face. Pulls both triggers, thinking the gun was loaded, but my mom had unloaded that gun. So here we got a violent man, a real outlaw, a bootlegger. And his sin tendencies were passed down to me. My grandfather on my dad's side had some serious mental illnesses. My grandfather on my mother's side was a raging, mean, Irish, German alcoholic that was abusive to his wife. Now, all these men got saved and come to the Lord and preached the gospel late in life, but they passed some sin iniquities down to me. And that is important that we realize that. We have to understand generational iniquities and how to break those iniquities with, um, under the obedience of Christ. So I'm going to go, I can remember vividly back to four years old. We uh, lived in some apartments in West End. I can remember even uh, partially uh, visiting my grandmother in Mount Olive uh, when I was three years old, going outside and picking poke salad for her to cook for me. I thought it was neat that I could go in the woods and pick something and bring it to my grandmother and her cooking. You can eat poke salad if you're not. If you've never eaten poke salad, you ain't country. I'm just going to tell I'm you. not country. You ain't country. Mm -hmm. Marilyn's not country. She ain't never eaten poke salad and eggs. Mm -mm. But uh, I can remember that. But when I was uh, four years old, we lived in an apartment in West End. And a couple of blocks away, there was a park. And at that time, even at four years old, me and my little friends, I had a little girlfriend. Her name was Connie. And I remember her name. Uh, Hein Kemp was her last name. Her parents were dead. I remember all of that. Yeah, that I didn't mention her name. I didn't mention her name. I did. It's Facebook Live. But anyway, we were rumbling around the back of an apartment walking, and we seen 
uh, uh, the dogs had gotten in some garbage. And there in the garbage was a porn magazine. Four years old. Exposed to pornography in 1972. What's the chances of that happening? At around six years old, five and six years old, I noticed that the smell of gasoline was very intriguing to me. Mom and Daddy caught me uh, between the washer and the wall with my nose in a can of gas high as a kite at five and six years old. Um, we, this is the hard part. This is where it really gets ugly. This is the why. So we see those traps. We see the, the gas and, and the, the laying a trap. See, the generational iniquities aren't that complicated. Uh, darkness knows your propensity toward a particular sin, and he lays traps. See, like trying to get me to gamble is stupid. I'm just not going to gamble. You know, trying to get me to gamble is stupid. I'm not going to gamble. You can't entice me to gambling. It doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather spend my money on something else. That's, you know, but... Um, getting high, money, um, sex, stuff like that are things that I was very, had a propensity toward. And um, so at around nine years old, I had an uncle that, um, a great uncle, uh, and he's gone on to be with the Lord now. And um, he started molesting my little brother and myself. My little brother has been dead for um, 20 years now, um, 21 years now. And, um, it was a lot worse on him than it was me, you know, and I still blame myself for a lot of that. I didn't really understand what was going on, but when I realized that he was hurting my little brother, that's when I called attention to the situation and everything stopped. Now, the counseling should have been a part post that, but it wasn't. Back then, I guess, we just thought it was best to just keep everything quiet. Well, it wasn't a good idea to keep everything quiet. You know, if your kids are going through something like that, uh, I'm a big, big proponent in counseling. Um, you can call it secular counseling, Christian counseling. These people know to help you process your emotions. And it's important that if our kids are going through something like that, that we, um, we get them there. Well, so um, <clears throat> what happens? What happens? We were... Um, so... When something like that happens to a, uh, a male, a man, we um, uh, start to feel very weak. Uh, we feel very, um, you know, we're kids, we can't help ourselves. So we, in me, it built this rage, this fight, this, um, um, this intense anger. Um, and that was already my dad and my grandfather on my mom's side already had an anger problems. My dad was a very angry, very rageful man. I mean, even later in life, even as a minister, man, he would get mad. He would, he, he would get intense. He would really get mad. Uh, so that built this rage and everything inside of me. And, um, you know, it caused me a lot of problems in my life. Now, my dad started pastoring a church. Um, he had a decent job. Um, he worked really hard, but we had two sets of bills. We had the bills that um, were for the house, and then we had the church's bills. So we didn't ever have as much as the rest of the kids. You know, I had to save up to buy my first car, uh, 1973 Ford Maverick, $650 is what I paid for it. Uh, and I saved that money. I earned it. Um, and uh, um, so it, when I was looking at all this stuff, these other kids getting new cars at school, something was inside of me that I wanted to be successful. And I wanted to be successful at any cost. Now, one of the good points about that is, is I developed an incredible work ethic. Whether I'm working for minimum wage or uh, $150 an hour, uh, I'm going to give you the same effort. The amount of money doesn't matter to me. I just go to work to work, whether it's in the gym or pastoring a church or whatever I'm doing. Sometimes I get um, disorganized. Sometimes I get scattered. Sometimes I lack focus. But man, I am wide open. 
I'm going to get something done. So I had this burning the des desire to succeed by any means. Um, the weak and helpless feeling just never went away. I rebelled uh, when I was 17 years old really hard. I moved out of my mom and dad's house. I still graduated high school, had a full-time job. I enlisted in the Army. When I got out there, we lived a very sheltered Pentecostal life. No football games, no movies. Uh, my sister wasn't allowed to wear pants. Uh, it was old school Pentecostal bondage. So that instilled some more issues in me toward church. It was uh, a right relationship with God by following a list of rules instead of getting a right relationship with God and then God working on you from the inside out instead of the outside in, entire different subject. But here I get in the army and I go wild, man. I start drinking. Um, I start fighting. I join a Taekwondo class. I start doing some mixed martial arts. Um, you know, next thing I know, I hit the charge of quarters. Um, I get in a fight with five MPs. Um, I lose all my rank. And they give me, um, they're looking at sending me to military jail. Um, but my work record was really, really good. So um, I ended up getting a general discharge under honorable conditions. At the same time all this was going on, there was a, an evangelist by the name of Bill Clark. He's on my friends list. He was running a revival for my dad when I was in the Army. My mom knew I was in trouble. You know how moms are. So mom was praying and seeking God. And the more she prayed, the more trouble I got into. Desert storms about to kick off. And I'm in headquarters, headquarters company, material maintenance command, division support command. I'm in the first company to get deployed for the first infantry division. We are the first to go. And we would have went to Kuwait or Iraq or wherever they went. Well, right before all that kicked, up, kicked off, my mama prayed me out of the military. And I didn't go. If I'd have got over there and started shooting stuff, ain't no telling what would have happened to me. I, I don't know. I might have got killed, whatever. But God had a different plan. And even though my fighting and my drinking and my all the stuff that I was doing, God's bigger than that. God used all of the all of my mess ups to put me in the position where I am now. And you're fixing to really follow that as we continue with this story. So here I am. If I get home. I get kicked out of the army. You know, I'm just like, what am I gonna do? Uh, my brother gets me a job of law engineering. I'm a fairly smart fellow. I take some tests. I end up scoring real high. End up getting a job as an industrial radiographer. Next thing you know, uh, Hurricane Hugo comes through and I'm down in the Virgin Islands. Lord have mercy, that is the last place I needed. No tax on liquor and really pure cocaine. That was the last place I needed to be. And I'm making just $100,000 a year. I'm working 70 hours a week. I'm 21 years old, 22 years old, and, 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 and I got all the money in the world. I work so much I can't spend the money, and I got all the cocaine, and then they tried to keep us in a man camp so they give us all the beer we could drink every night for free. So here I am, I spent a little over a year down there doing piles of cocaine. Finally, I come to my senses and I come home. Uh, I was dating my first wife at that time, the girl's mother. I come home and we'll get married. I had a bunch of money in the bank. I mean, we were set, so I decided that I'm gonna be in the ministry full time. And, um, but see, I had never dealt with the issues. See, I was still thinking that uh, if I pretended they wasn't there, they would go away. They don't go away. You can pretend all you want to, but if you don't acknowledge what led you to addiction, you will never overcome what you're in bondage to. So we rocked on. We did pretty good. I mean, I preached some Terry revivals when I was pretty cool. This crazy guy, Terrapin Robbins, he come to me and he said, um, um, why don't you come preach this tent revival and 
I go down there, of course, this is in the middle of August, and this is back when you had to wear, I had to wear a suit and tie, so here I am, I'm in my suit and tie, and I'm preaching under this tent revival, and seeing the first demon cast out of somebody was awesome, seeing a guy get miraculously delivered from drinking a fifth and a case of beer a day with no DTs, and then Daddy told me that uh, 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 at the end of the tent revival, the guy that was running the tent revival was the guy he pulled the shotgun on some years later. That was a whole... Boy, that come full circle, didn't it? Uh, but, you know, we, we ended up taking a position in Carbon Hill. Uh, we just couldn't make the ends meet. My car got repossessed, and, you know, I'm just discouraged, so I go down to the Honda dealership and get me a job selling cars. And I do good. Man, I'm, I'm one of the top salesperson. We're back to rocking and rolling again. Um, <clears throat> eventually, I, I moved into management and, and with the car business, and then eventually I got out of that, and I opened an alarm company, uh, first response. I'd been in the alarm business before. Uh, the first seven months in business, we did $2.1 million the first full year, and uh uh, first 12 months, we did 4.3 million. The first full year in business, we did 4.7 million dollars. I opened an internet company, which was an ISP back when it, you know, the AOL dial-up. We had a local one in Fultondale, Alabama. Then I opened an investment company where I buy and alarm contracts and bundling them and then selling them to Ameritech and um, Protection One and ADT uh, and Monotronics. Um, but during this, all this time, um, I had resisted uh, ever taking a pain pill. I had blew my knee out, um, my left knee, and I've had two surgeries on it. And I got uh, incredibly overweight, and it was hurting really bad. Well, one, of the, uh, one day, um, I'm sleeping about two hours a night. I'm eating ibuprofen by the handfuls. Uh, I had the three businesses. One day I sat down in front of a computer and I had a grandma seizure. Turns out I'm anemic, my stomach's bleeding. So the doctor says, you cannot take any more NSAIDs. But what I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, uh, back then it was Lortab. And uh, he gave me Lortab. And that did good for a while. But I knew that because the addiction in my family, because of my siblings, all of them had been addicted to, to pain medications, I knew I didn't need to do that. Now, <clears throat> what I needed to do is I needed to lose weight. I was 5'6", I, I think I was 5'7", then I'm 5'6", now, and I was 300 pounds. I needed the doctor to help me lose weight, but he didn't. He gave me a pill, and he gave me a pill for my type 2, bi bi type 2 diabetes. He gave me a pill for my uh, liver uh, enzymes. He gave me a pill for my cholesterol. He gave me a pill for my high blood pressure, and eventually he started giving me a pill for my anxiety and a pill for my depression. One pill after another pill on another... And you know how it goes. You know how the story goes. And what he should have said is said, hey, you need some counseling and you need to stop eating donuts. But he didn't do that because doctors, they practice medicine. They write prescriptions. After a while, the more time didn't work. And I remember sitting down in front of a doctor, and I know I shouldn't mention names. Let me tell you about this joker. Dr. Winston Bradley Walker County, Alabama, Jasper, the opiate uh, capital of the world, sat down from him. He said, man, this pharmaceutical rep told me about this great new pill. It's called Oxycontin. It's 80 milligrams. It's time release. It's not as addictive. Man, I like those things, especially when I figured out you could eat the coating off of them and crush them and snort them. And you could get that full 80 milligrams. And then I found me a pharmacist that was compounded in, in the back of his pharmacy. And, I, you know, I, by then I'm, I'm back in the, I done lost the alarm company. I'm back in the car business. I'm making 20, 30, 40, even $50,000 some months. So money wasn't an issue. I could buy anything I wanted. And I was just getting high. <clears throat> but then... You know, my mama kept praying. So here I am. I got a, from the pornography, I got this incredibly detestable sexual addiction. I was angry. I was cocky. I was arrogant. 
Forgiving people wasn't even in my vocabulary. I brought all of those addictions and all of that junk into my marriage. Five years into our marriage, we adopt Sarah. Four years later, we adopt Christian. Then we have Beth. Then we have Rachel. And then here I am. All of a sudden, I lose my job. Um, making the average of $35,000 a month as a used car director of Limbaugh Toyota. And um, my life becomes, it was already unraveled. It was just a mess. It was just a mess. We may have had the big house. We may have had a person to help us clean the house. We may have had somebody to help us watch the kids. We may have had a $900 a month car payment. We may have had a $2,600 a month house payment. We may have had marble thresholds, but it was a mess. It was awful. I can't even describe the stress because everything that I was doing, I knew was wrong. So then uh, my first wife started cheating on me. And I, I don't blame her. I don't, I don't, I don't blame her. I worked 90 hours a week. I was 300 pounds. I wasn't much to look at. I was just, I can't blame her at all. I was a horrible husband and even worse father. I was a mess. So as my make-believe house of cards begin to come unraveled, um, I got really in a bad shape. So I went to see my doctor in Warriors, a good man, Dr. Uh, Harper. And uh, he gave me this test and is answering, you know how them tests where they answer, ask you the same questions five different ways, it's about 50. And at the end of it, they grade it. The test is produced by the pharmaceutical company. And he said, man, you're, you're depressed. I'm like, yeah, no kidding, I'm depressed. I just lost a $35,000 a month job and my wife cheating on me. I'm depressed. So he said, well, what you need is you need Lexapro. I'm like, man, I need any kind of pro, whatever. Just give me more pills. That's what I need. I need more pills. Well, I didn't do too good on the Lexapro. I went crazy. There were some things that I, I don't think I would have ever done if I hadn't got put on the Lexapro. My inability to say no went out the window. I mean, I could go on and on telling y'all stuff that I, but I don't want to embarrass my family. I, I embarrassed them enough with all this stuff anyway. But there's things that are bad that I did. I should, I just went crazy. And then I had the idea, I'm like, man, you've paid the maximum into Social Security. I figured it up. The family's going to get about $4,000 a month. All I need to do is get a good life insurance policy that doubles and for me to go in and ask for a million dollar policy wasn't nothing. If you looked at my W-2s, I could get a million dollar policy. Well, I was going to get a $300,000 policy and have it double as an accident. And all that took place June the 1st. So I had this plan. Get the insurance. I bought me a 2007 night train, Harley Davidson. I was working in uh, a Cloverleaf, Chrysler, Dodge, Lincoln, Mercury, Azuzu, Jeep, whatever. There's six different franchises, two used car lots. So was the GSM. And, the, and there I am, and, and I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And then, that's what my family needed. That's what the devil had told me. The devil had told me that you, they don't need you. They just need money so they'll be okay. They'll do better without you. And I believed it. So since I didn't plan on being around, we were in a bind. We couldn't make the house payment. We couldn't make the car payments. Uh, couldn't buy the dope that we needed. So I committed, um, I pled guilty to 11 different counts of bank fraud to the sum of $127,000. Um, I didn't, wasn't really worried about getting caught because I didn't plan on being around. 
And one day Christian and I were pulling out of the uh, neighborhood, Hickory Ridge and Dora, and I looked in the rearview mirror and there's about seven or eight cars with flashing lights, but only one of them had flashing lights on top of the cars. I don't know if you know what that means, but that means the feds. <clears throat> so they pulled us over. Um, uh, the detective was really nice. He'd been watching me for a while. And he said, I know you got kids. We don't want to handcuff you in front of your kids. If you promise to act right, uh, we just need to search your home. We've got a search warrant. So here they go. They're going through the house. I look over there and of course anytime they come uh, 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 somebody's coming with a machine gun and I look over there and there's an FBI agent playing Xbox with Christian I'll never get that picture out of my head he was he was uh, um, he wasn't but about six years old um, yeah he was six years old and um, they got everything they needed uh, they put me in the back of the cop car and they took me and booked me into the Walker County Jail May 25th um, 2007. Um, T.J. Armstrong booked me in. He doesn't even remember. I'm like, that is a redneck Arab dude. I'm like, that is the most redneck voice I've ever heard come out of an Arab fellow in my life. T.J.'s an awesome guy. He does a lot of wonderful things in Walker County for people that are struggling with addiction. Um, so I get in there Within a couple of hours, a fellow had snuck marijuana weed into the Walker County Jail in his afro. He was a white guy, but he had afro. And then he asked me if I wanted some. We were selling, and I'm like, nah, man, I'm good. I'm really, we really need to reevaluate getting high here. You know, here I am. I'm in first time. I had done a little time in the drunk tanks and the army, but. This is my first time ever really being in county jail. So here I am, I'm, I'm sitting there, and, and I'm, then he takes a New Testament Bible, and he tears the paper out of it, and it begins to roll up his joint with the Bible. And man, that was one of those things in my mind that I'm like, man, how in the world did I get to this point? What? How did I get here? So for five days, they were booking a guy in for murder, and he had a $250,000 bond. I had a $300,000 bond. <laughs> $300,000. I didn't shoot nobody. I didn't even have a gun in the house. I had a pellet gun and some knives. I didn't own a gun because I knew my temper was bad, and I knew I could probably shoot somebody before I ever rationally processed the thought. So here I'm out a $300,000 bond. But that was God because I needed a few days. And for those few days, I prayed and I cried and I prayed as loud as I could. I prayed in tongues. I did not care. And when I got out of there, I knew I was going to have to face it. I had a revelation. I had a visitation from the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that. The guy quickly reminded me what I was born to do. See, when I was 10 years old, I went to an altar to pray. Right in the middle of being molested by my uncle, I went to the altar to pray, and the Lord slain me in the Spirit. And as my lips were quivering, and I just heard the Lord say one word, preacher. And then I found the Scripture in Corinthians. It said, Woe is me if I preach not the Gospel. So I got this tattoo, born to preach, because I'm not born to run a car lot, I'm not born to, I'm not born to run a business, I'm not born to own a lawyer company, I, I was born to preach, I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm an old school throwback, loud preacher, and a pastor, and uh, <clears throat> so I get out, and I, 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 I'm at home, we have to move out of the house, for 14 months, we're basically homeless, sleeping on people's couches. The infidelity continued, just all kind of things. I woke up one day and I, I, I found, um, you know, I don't know how much this should I have to tell, but this is important. I, I, I found that um, the, 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 the cheating had continued, so 
I'd come up with a plan to kill this guy. And I got up the next morning with 104 fever and having pneumonia. And man, I was so sick. By the time I got better, the guy was in Wyoming. Uh, but I really was. He or I were going to die that day. But I woke up with 104 fever. Um, that's just God's providence. I think God knew I was serious. So we eventually got settled in parish and, and I started going to the parish church of God of Prophecy. Brother Cephas Prophet, uh, he took me in and he, he sent me stuff while I was in prison. Um, um, he used me, he preached me before I went to prison and when I got out of prison. And in October 2008, I started my 30 month prison sentence. And I went in there with the determination to find out why. Remember how we started this? Why? Why are you so violent? Why do you detest church so much? Um, why do you want to get high? Why are you willing to do anything for things? Why do you love sin more than you love your family? Why, why, do you, why are you willing to forsake your children to get high? Why? 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 Well, all of that stuff had to be unpacked and I had to deal with. The unforgiveness for my uncle, the unforgiveness for myself concerning my little brother feeling like I abandoned him when I joined the army, the, the, the unforgiveness for my ex-wife, the, the unforgiveness for my parents about not dealing with the, you know, getting me some help when I'm 9 and 10 and, and I don't understand what's going on, you know, and I process all this stuff and, 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 and I want to blame this person and blame that person. And I mean, and a lot of blame it, it can be placed, but eventually I can't fix anybody else. I can only fix me. And, and if I want to get fixed, I got to start accepting my part and the decisions that I've made. And in that 30 months in prison, I decided I was going to figure out what, why, why, why. And it all went back to, I'm not addicted to drugs. I'm not addicted to sex. I'm not addicted to alcohol. I'm not addicted to bitterness, unforgiveness. I'm not addicted to rage. I'm not addicted to the adrenaline rush of fighting. I'm addicted to sin. Whether it be eating a bag of donuts or crushing an Oxycontin 80 and snorting it, whether it be uh, having sex outside of marriage and then all the stuff that went with that, whether it be to pornography or whatever it is, it all encompasses, I was addicted to sin. And all of this hurt and all of this anger, all of this bitterness and all of this unforgiveness, the sin would settle my spirit temporarily. Man, I could, I could get high and forget about everything. Does anybody relate? You know, one of the biggest struggles we see with people is when they first start to get sober and they realize the decisions that they made, it's so hard to keep them on that track because they've got to face their decisions. Well, I had a lot to face. <clears throat> so I get out of prison and I go to church at Parish Church of God of Prophecy uh, I receive a direct word from the Lord to get a divorce uh, I didn't have any choice I, I, don't, I blame the failed marriage on me but I mean I, I, they, we were just headed I was headed toward ministry and, and she was headed another direction and the Lord told me, you know, if you don't do something, you're going to end up spending the rest of your life in prison for murder. You just are. You're not going to, she, she's not going to do right. And I'm, you know, so I did. And after several years of trying to reconcile, and then uh, um, the, the, the organization that I'm in now, the Church of God of Prophecy, um, the state overseer at the time, when I, my divorce was over with, I started dating, and he told me I couldn't preach anymore. And I'm like, man, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. 
So, what I do? Uh, I had to leave the parish church of God of Prophecy. I ended up at Dilworth Church of God, and Brother Kimberly preached me. We started working at Celebrate Recovery. We helped them with opening their men's center, you know, and, and of course, I'm still young in the Lord. I'm still making a lot of mistakes. I'm still growing. I'm still dealing with these strongholds. I'm still dealing with the bondage. I'm still jacked up, but man, I'm pressing. I'm pressing. I'm pressing. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to cut some grass. I don't know what I want to do for a living. I'm trying to do some yard work, and it's really not making the bill, paying the bills. It's not providing for my family, and, and I decide I want to get into wholesaling uh, cars, and then next thing you know, I get back into the car business. Now, my post-prison time in the car business, you know, I, I didn't do things the way I did it before. When I ran the, the, the lot, I did things with integrity. I done things the right way. Um, but I found myself in the middle of what the car business is known for. Dope, dope, and more dope. Here I am, I'm trying to preach the gospel, working at Celebrate Recoveries, and there is drugs all around me. Even in the, the, the small little lots, even... You know, it's just, it's a mess. And I'm like, how did I end up here? But I stayed there for six and a half years and eventually I got, I got um, sick and had to leave that profession. We'll talk about that in a second. You know, when I got home, um, um, we had, my wife and I agreed that I would take custody of the two older kids, should take custody of the two younger kids. I didn't really have peace about it. I started praying. Um, and then I eventually ended up with custody of all four of my kids. And um, and then uh, uh, you know, and then Sarah's in Colorado. Rachel's in there in the living room. Beth and Christian are with their mom now. 2015, I uh, meet Marilyn. I, I, I married a second time. It didn't work out. I met Marilyn. We started a program in uh, Jasper, uh, Celebrate Freedom, dealing with the spiritual aspects of um, addiction. Um, you know, around 2019, my dad starts getting really sick. Uh, I had left my job um, and I started helping my dad fix his house. Um, I started writing the book, The Unaddicted, which we're just making a few revisions now. Uh, and I started preaching at um, Short Creek. Uh, after my dad announced his retirement, they asked me to start pastoring Short Creek. But you know, that's, that's my testimony. From the time I'm four years old to pastoring Short Creek today, 11 felonies, uh, 30 months in federal prison, um, addicted to food, addicted to power, addicted to drugs, addicted to sex, addicted to pornography. Just a mess. Just a straight up mess and um, still struggle today but I know God's bigger than my struggles and God's bigger than your struggles when I get up behind that pulpit in Short Creek I don't pretend that I'm something I'm not if I'm struggling you know I'm struggling if I'm sick you know I'm sick if I'm angry you know I'm angry if I'm bitter, you know I'm bitter. Um, but man, God has blessed us with a lot of fruit. When I look over that congregation and I see the Morgan Gills, the Mark, the Melissas, the Tammy Ballinger, um, when I see all these people that the Lord has blessed us with at Short Creek, when I see the lives that have been changed, um, it lets me know that I'm on the right track. So, my tattoo may disqualify me in some of your eyes. My may not like my beard. May not like my ripped jeans. May not like my record. And that's cool. That's your prerogative. But I'm not going to stop <laughs> for nothing or nobody. So that's my testimony. I hope it helps somebody. Um, 
You know, no matter where you're at in life, no matter the mistakes that you've made, no matter what's going on, God is bigger than your mistakes. God can pick you up out of that pit, put your feet on solid ground. You're not too bad to be used by God. Look at the people the Lord has used in the Bible. Look at what's going on at Short Creek and I, I'm the pastor. I promise you, God needs you. God wants you. God loves you. And God will restore you. Just like he has done for me and so many people that have struggled the way that I have. God bless y'all. Y'all have a good day.